Section 1. You'll hear a woman complaining about an item she has bought. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Smart Electricals, Mike speaking. How may I help you today? Ah, oh, good morning. I'm calling to complain about an item I recently purchased from your company. I'm not happy with it. Oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. I'll take you through the company's complaints procedure. I'll need to retrieve your files from our records so that we can discuss the problem properly and find a solution. I'll need to take some details from you first. Is that OK? OK, but I don't have a lot of time. Will it take long? Not long, madam. Can I first take your name? Yes, it's Susan York. Y-O-R-K-E. OK. Can I have the address, please? Yes, it's flat 1, 25 Alpine Avenue. That's A-L-P-I-N-E Avenue. Harchester. The postcode is H-A-6-5-L-D. OK. Next. Could you give me your telephone number? Preferably one that we can call you on during normal working hours. Well, the home one is 01734-525-268. But you're only likely to catch me on that number in the evenings. I usually have my mobile phone with me during the day, though. It's probably best to take that number, then. All right. My mobile number is 781 252 and do you have the order reference number on you, by any chance? Well, I have the receipt that the camera came with in front of me. Ah, good. Which number is it? It's a bit confusing. It should be the seven-digit number on the top left corner of your invoice. Let me have a look. I need my glasses. Found it. It's DMX8443. Thanks. Now, when did you purchase the item? Well, the camera was delivered last Monday, on the 1st of February. I ordered it online about two weeks before that, but I can't remember the exact date. If you have another look on the invoice receipt, the date should be there. Oh, yes. Here it is. January the 15th. OK. I'll make a note of that. So, the item is a digital camera? Yes, it's the Aqua PowerShot model, in silver. Thank you. Did you take out any kind of insurance when you bought it? Well, no. It was on special offer. I didn't need to pay any extra for the insurance because it came with a special four-star policy. Well, it means you're fully covered for at least another three years. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Right. What is the problem? Yes, the first thing is that it came with one memory card in the box when there were supposed to be two. Oh, dear. I'm terribly sorry about that. It must have been an oversight in the packing department. 
I can do something about that straight away and get one sent out to you. Well, that's not the only thing. I bought it as a present for my niece because she loves swimming. It said on the website that it was waterproof, but when she took it on holiday and tried to use it underwater, it got ruined because water got into the lens. You can imagine how disappointed my niece was. I certainly can. Were those the only problems? No, there was one other thing. It came with a case to protect it. When I opened the box to take the case out, I saw that it had a big scratch on it. We're really sorry about that. I can offer to have the camera repaired for you. In the event that it can't be repaired, we'll send you a replacement. Um, I don't think so. Seeing as it was faulty in the first place, I wouldn't want another one. I think I'd rather have my money back. Can I get a refund? Yes, of course. If you send it back to customer services, I'll make sure it's dealt with. Thank you very much. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You will hear a woman asking a shop assistant about DVD players. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Hello, I'm interested in buying a DVD player. Can you help me, as I don't know very much about them? Of course. We sell quite a range. Actually, we're doing a customer survey at the moment, so I wonder if I could fill in this form about you, and that will actually help me to advise you on the best DVD player for you. Oh, OK. <laughs> First of all, your occupation. Um, student. OK. Then, have you already got a DVD player? Uh, no, I've never had one before. Uh-huh. And how much do you think you want to spend on a player? Mm, I'm not sure, really. But I have got a budget. My friend said I should allow about £100. But I can't afford over £85, so that's what I'm working on. Mm-hmm. And do you watch DVDs very often? Um, depends what you mean by often. I don't know what the norm is. Is it about two a week? Uh, I suppose I watch three a month. <laughs> that's enough for me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what sort of films do you like watching, then? Action movies? <laughs> Not really. Oh. My boyfriend always insists we watch science fiction movies, but I prefer thrillers. Something to get your teeth into. OK. Just one more. Do you watch other DVDs, ones that are not films, like music or something? Not much, because I don't want to spend the money on something I can watch on TV but I occasionally rent out comedy programmes and I fight with my boyfriend over all the sports DVDs he watches. Before you hear the rest of the programme, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. OK, let me explain a bit to you about the DVD players that are in your price range. First, there's the DB30, which has only got basic features, but it is a bargain at £69. Now, all the DVDs come with an after-sales service that starts when the guarantee runs out. As it's so cheap, the DB30 comes with a limited after-sales service, as it only includes parts. You would have to pay for most of the repair. Mm, mm, seems OK. Mm. Then, a slight grade up from that is the XL643. This comes with an additional feature in that it has an extra button allowing you to record. That's quite useful. Oh, yes. That would mean spending less on DVDs to watch. Yes, so you'd make the extra money back on it that it costs. Mm. Let me see how much it is. Uh, ah, yes, that one's actually reduced at the moment from £79 to £71.99. Oh. I think it's worth the extra myself. And is that the same level of after-sales service as the other one? Well, you get a bit more for your money because what we're offering is a discount on labour. So you don't pay the full price if you have to call an engineer out. I see. Then the last one is this Tri-X24. It's a very good player and you can use it to listen to your CDs as well as watch DVDs. Mm, it looks nice, but I bet it's expensive. No, it's not top of the range. Let's see. Yes, it's £94. But what you have to remember is that that includes insurance, so you don't have to pay extra for that. And it comes with a guarantee that's valid for three years, as opposed to the usual one. What do you think? Mm, maybe... That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You are going to hear an introduction to the facilities and regulations of the main university library. You will hear three different speakers describe different aspects of the library. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hello, my name's John Giles. It's good to see you all here for this part of your orientation to the university. Libraries can be complicated and frightening places for new students, and my job's to make you feel welcome, show you how you can find your way around, and introduce you to people who can give you further information and advice about using the library. I'll give you a general introduction to the printed materials, then Susie, who you will meet in a few minutes, will talk about our multimedia services. And finally, Jonathan Freeland, our head librarian, will outline the rules and regulations you must observe as library users. First, though, on behalf of my colleagues and myself, I want you to know that we are all at your service. Unlike many libraries, we insist that all our librarians have an additional qualification 
in at least one of the subjects taught in the university. You will find librarians who are specialists in science, social sciences, and humanities. Most of our staff are also currently doing research and thus up to date with the periodical and internet literature, as well as the books. The second advantage we enjoy here is that all our books and periodicals are available from this building. Some of them have to be ordered from our underground stores, known as the stacks. But you don't have to visit more than one building to find the materials you need. This is because we are purpose built. Now, how do you find your way around? As you no doubt saw in the entrance hall, there is a plan of the library showing you where the books and periodicals can be found for any particular subject. We keep the books and periodicals for each subject on the same floor. So, for instance, environmental sciences are color coded green and are housed on the ground floor towards the front. Geography is color coded brown and can be found on the ground floor towards the back of the building. Each room is organized on the same plan. Reference books, which cannot be taken out of the library, are found at the far end of each room, near the librarian's desk, or station as we call it. Next to them, on the right, are periodicals for the last two years. The rest of the shelves contain general books on the subject. These can be borrowed. Lastly, the domestic arrangements. Seating. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. The library is of two kinds. Rectangular tables for up to six people and individual study booths known as carols. No, not Christmas carols. At every seat there is a PowerPoint for a laptop computer. There is also a panel which lights up to tell you when a book you have ordered is ready for collection from the librarian's desk. After all that hard work, you'll be ready for something to eat. And there are slot machines on every floor where you can buy food and drink. In the basement is a cafeteria where you can order fast food such as pizza, hamburgers, and also fish and chips, salad and fruit. You mustn't bring food and drink into the reading rooms though. Ah, here's Susie Wallace to tell you about the high-tech facilities of the library. Thanks, John. Don't worry, this isn't going to require a degree in systems engineering to get the hang of. Anyway, with computers and audio systems, the best way to learn is by doing. But here's a few tips to get you started. If there's anything else you want to know, each piece of equipment has a manual explaining how to use it, and either I or Elaine, my very capable assistant, will be on hand to get you sorted out. First off, I'd like you all to follow me over to the Multimedia Centre. You have to come through this room to get to it in any case. Then gather round and I'll talk about each piece of equipment as we get to it. Right, here we are. Now, the Multimedia Centre, or MMC for short, houses all the computer facilities you'll need for your degree studies and your language learning. Many of you are studying electronics or similar subjects. We have terrific facilities for learning CAD, Computer Aided Design, for you non technies some leading companies have donated equipment and state-of-the-art software packages. That's a spin-off from our thriving Industry Links program. Many of you will be going on for your job experience. But to get back to the point, we have 44 PC terminals and 6 Macs. The Macs are loaded with fantastic software for you, art and design and textile design students. Over here, you can see our two widescreen TV monitors. They can receive broadcasts in most Asian and European languages, as well as English. For English language news, we encourage you to use the Student Union TV room, so that those who are learning other languages can use these. Some useful broadcasts come at awkward times, so if you get a note from your academic advisor on a form we'll give you, we can tape up to two hours a week for you. 
In a moment, I leave you to explore on your own. But here's our head librarian to say a brief word about library regulations. Good morning. I'm sorry to sound like a police officer, but there are a few rules we all need to observe for the benefit of everybody. Courtesy to staff and other library users comes high up the list. Second, the security and safekeeping of materials is essential. All library items are electronically tagged. If the beeper goes off as you leave, you must return to the checkout desk. You are not allowed to bring any bags, packages, or outdoor clothing into the reading rooms. You must leave them in the lockers outside in the corridor. You must take reasonable care of library materials while they are in your possession and return them within two weeks of borrowing them. Failure to return them on time without a good reason will result in a fine. When you register to join the library, you will get a copy of the full rules, and you must sign this to say that you obey them. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four, on page fourteen. Section four. You will hear a speaker giving a talk about some recent research about unusual life forms. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty, on pages fourteen and fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the sixth of our ecology evening classes. Nice to see you all again. As you know from the program, today I want to talk to you about some research that is pushing back the frontiers of the whole field of ecology. And this research is being carried out in the remoter regions of our planet, places where the environment is harsh, and until recently, it was thought that the conditions couldn't sustain life of any kind. But life forms are being found, and these have been grouped into what is now known as extremophiles. That is, organisms that can survive in the most extreme environments. And these discoveries may be setting a huge challenge for the scientists of the future, as you'll see in a minute. Now, the particular research I want to tell you about was carried out in Antarctica, one of the coldest and driest places on Earth. But a multinational team of researchers from the U.S., Canada, and New Zealand recently discovered colonies of microbes in the soil there. Where no one thought it was possible. Interestingly enough, some of the colonies were identified as a type of fungus called Bouveria bassiana, a fungus that lives on insects. But where are the insects in these utterly empty regions of Antarctica? The researchers concluded that this was clear evidence that these colonies were certainly not new arrivals. They might have been there for centuries or even millennia. Possibly even since the last ice age, can you imagine their excitement? Now, some types of microbes had previously been found living just a few millimeters under the surface of rocks, porous Antarctic rocks, but this was the first time that living colonies had been found surviving、um, relatively deeply in the soil itself, several centimeters down, in fact.
So, the big question is, how can these colonies survive there? Well, we know that the organisms living very near the rock's surface can still be warmed by the sun, so they can survive in their own microclimate. And this keeps them from freezing during the day. But this isn't the case for the colonies that are hidden under the soil. In their research paper, this team suggested that the very high amounts of salt in the soil might be the clue because this is what is preventing essential water from freezing. The team found that the salt concentration increased the deeper down they went in the soil. But while they had expected the number of organisms to be fewer down there, they actually found the opposite. In soil that had as much as 3,000 parts of salt per million, relatively high numbers of microbes were present, which seems incredible. But the point is that at those levels of salt, the temperature could drop to minus 56 degrees before frost would cause any damage to the organisms. This relationship between microbes and salt, at temperatures way below the normal freezing point of water, is a really significant breakthrough. As you all know, life is dependent on the availability of water in liquid form, and the role of salt at very low temperatures could be the key to survival in these kinds of conditions. Now, the process at work here is called supercooling, and that's usually written as one word, but it isn't really understood as yet, so there's a lot more for researchers to work on. However, the fact that this process occurs naturally in Antarctica may suggest that it might occur in other places with similar conditions including on our neighbouring planet, Mars. So, you can start to see the wider implications of this kind of research. In short, it appears to support the growing belief that extraterrestrial life might be able to survive the dry, cold conditions on other planets after all. Not only does this research produce evidence that life is possible there, it's also informing scientists of the locations where it might be found. So all of this might have great significance for future unmanned space missions. One specialist on Mars confirms the importance of the... That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.